Welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Well, I want to welcome you, Dr. Tan, to the Conversations on Healing podcast. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I hope this will be a productive time in two ways. <laughs> I'm sure it will. So I want to let our listeners know a little bit what they're in for today in a good way. You are one of the preeminent experts on vitamin E, and you've studied vitamin E for more than 40 years. And so you have a lot of uh, knowledge about some of the health benefits, particularly for one type of vitamin E that we'll be discussing today. Um, and so I thought maybe we would just start with a brief overview of the four different groups of vitamin E, just so our listeners understand some of the basics. Well, thank you. Um, vitamin E was first discovered exactly 100 years ago. And that group of vitamin E is called tocopherol. You'll find it in a cereal box. And then, like you said, there are four of them. There are four Greek letters, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And probably the most well-known one is alpha tocopherol. That's the tocopherol group. And then there's another group called tocotrienol. That's a hypervitamin E that you mentioned like that. It was discovered probably about 50 years after the first group of tocopherols. And so it's kind of like a runt in a sense that uh, it almost got missed, but it was not. And that was in the 1960s. And then I started my career in the 1980s. I was interested in this group of compounds, studied them, and I've stayed with them since the early 1980s to today, which is for about 40 years from now. Beautiful. And I know that vitamin E has been shown to be beneficial for the treatment of certain chronic conditions, including metabolic syndrome, prediabetes and diabetes, fatty liver conditions, and cancer. And so I'm curious about some of the theories on why vitamin E is beneficial for these chronic conditions. Yes. It, initially, these conditions were set to work from our tocopherol, the, the first groups that were discovered. And then in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, a lot of studies on this, just as tocotrienol was being discovered. And if the audience or, you, or all of us would look in the internet and try to look for vitamin E or tocopherol, you'll find that in the uh, late 1990s into uh, uh, the first 10 years of this century, you find that vitamin E didn't work at, at best. And at worst, it may even do some harm. That's referring to tocopherol. So, so I, I thought I, I should set the stage for that. Otherwise, if the audience start to look and say, oh, I'm seeing things that are opposite to what Dr. Tan said, you know, then, but then on the second half, the last uh, 20 years or so, the groups, uh, the groups of toco, uh, vitamin E that's called tocotrienol, people begin to do the kind of studies that you mentioned. And it worked be, uh, in my judgment because if you think of a vitamin E like that, uh, of a, a, a tadpole, has a head and a tail. Essentially, a tocotrienol have a shorter tail, same head, and then the tail of a tocopherol longer. So the longer tail of a tocopherol and a shorter tail of tocotrienol has bearing in this sense. If you think of a cell, that it has cell wall, and, and the vitamin E is stuck, is situated right inside the cell wall, and a tocotrienol shorter, with the shorter tail is anchored less deeply and is able to spin around the cell 50 times faster. And for that reason, the tocotrienol as a class is more efficient 
in protecting the cell wall than a tocopherol. And there's a very interesting part of your story where you had been studying vitamin E already, and then you were traveling, I believe you were in Peru, and you came across a plant, um, a plant called anato, which is found in the Amazon and some other parts of the world. It is considered kind of an ancient superfood. <laughs> yes. It's fascinating because vitamin E can be extracted from it. Um, and in particular, this uh, specific form of vitamin E, the tocotrienol that you're mentioning, um, is abundant in this particular plant. And so I wanted for you to share a little bit about that discovery and then how you have utilized that discovery in your current research. Yes, this plan, uh, what I discovered this plan. Uh, about 25 years ago, it's known, but this guy, see, I went to Peru to look for marigold and a younger me with hair like that. And I did find the marigold. Um, then about 30 feet away from me, I saw the anato plant. It's beautiful. I'll show you a picture of that. It will look like this. You can see so for that. anyone watching on YouTube, you can actually see the images of Dr. Tan. But if you're listening, it's a beautiful plant with what looks like, how would you describe the center there? It's these very red, round, um, they look like berries, but uh, maybe you can describe it better. They do. <laughs> if, if you see, it, it looks very reddish. It's used for coloring foods. In the US or in Western country, it gives color to that orangey yellowish hue of cheese and some other meats as well. And you did mention that this was an ancient plant. Yes, you can see this would be an example of how the Inca have used it for a long time. And it is truly an Amazonian plant. So there, there you have it. I went to South America looking uh, for the marigold plant for lutein and zeaxanthin is good for the eye and, and that i did find and i then fate has it 30 feet away from me is this anato plant also have carotene and i surmise that something is protecting the carotene from destruction of the color i was expecting it to be other powerful antioxidant like polyphenol but it wasn't it was tocotrienol, something I was already familiar with. And then I, I thought, all right. So when I study this, uh, uh, this plant, uh, uh, in plant kingdom, most of the vitamin E uh, are tocopherols, you know? And, and then, so, but this is, there's no tocopherol in here. So that's one surprising thing. And it's only tocotrienol. And it's fascinating too, because I've heard you mention this, that there are both synergistic and antagonistic effects, you know, and reactions um, that happen in nature. And specifically between tocopherols and tocotrienols, there's an antagonistic effect if they are both contained within the same plant. But because anato only has the tocotrienols, that antagonistic effect isn't occurring. Would you like to explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Shay. Uh, um, now, in nature, we usually accept the premise that if in allopathic medicine, one thing does one treatment. And in nature, when they make certain chemical, it's always a, a mix of different chemical. And we usually believe in the axiom that if, if uh, uh, we make human make one chemical to treat a disease then in in nature they make a mixture of chemical it would be synergistic this is one example where uh, we use we did not ex think that it would be antagonistic but when we did study in earlier years we found that half the time it worked and half the time it didn't work so if half the time it didn't work then it's no good so we were just a, a, a bewildered why is it like that and then we stopped 
all the clinical study and then went back to the bench work. That was then we discovered that when we add back the tocopherol, as the, the same amount of tocotron add back, that's when we systematically saw that the same amount of tocotron, you know, would not work simply by adding back the tocopherol. And then thereafter, when we found this out and found out that it's free of tocopherol, then I got excited again. And then so my t last 25 years was essentially reinvested in doing this. So that actually is a true story. I would, I, I have already kind of like gave it up and then it was driven me back to this. So, so probably if you read my enthusiasm is because I'm finding a new lease of something coming back. <laughs> right, exactly. And so the benefit is that this Anato plant only has the tocotrienol, as you were mentioning. So it doesn't have those antagonistic effects that can occur. Um, so another piece of your story that I think is really interesting is then you decided, okay, you wanted to learn to extract the tocotrienol from the Anato plant. But apparently your wife <laughs> was very clear with you that you had to do it in a good way, um, that you couldn't use solvents or chemicals, and that, you know, you had to respect um, the plant itself. And so I'm interested to hear kind of how you've chosen to do the extraction process and what you've learned from that. Yeah, and because the context of this discovery was more spiritual and personal. So when a discovery happened, my wife said that you are not going to use chemical and solvent, which is easy to do to extract and purify things like many drugs are. But can you think of something uh, that would uh, pay attention to the naturalness of this? So that request from my wife uh, took me at least no less than five to seven years to figure it out. So it was not an easy process. So essentially, I use a physical process by evaporation. So in other words, I just pull a high vacuum, which is physical. And then I just, if you pull high enough vacuum, it will just evaporate like that. And the process is slower. Uh, uh, it's not as, uh, as clear cut as you would use chemical and solvent. But at the end, we were able uh, to make this vitamin E very pure and is able to uh, do all the clinical studies we had pursued following it. So thank That's you that. for asking. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about the research and what you think might be some of the mechanisms of action. It appears that with the tocotrienols, there is a reduction in inflammation in the body and you're seeing certain conditions such, such as cystic fibrosis, muscular sclerosis, lupus, that seem to be benefiting from taking this kind of purified form of vitamin E. So I would be interested to hear what you think is actually happening in the body and why you think it's having this anti-inflammatory effect. When we first discovered this compound, I knew it was the mechanism was it was able to lower cholesterol. It was totally different, but lowering cholesterol was a big deal because people take statin drug and cholesterol get higher as we get older like that. So I was pursuing to study that and it did. And then I noticed that it also lower other lipids like triglyceride, which is very important in the metabolic syndrome. And then that was also great now. Somewhere in the studying of lowering triglyceride, I thought, hey, you know, uh, uh, some of these people look like uh, uh, that when we study them and, and they lost a little bit of weight and then uh, uh, the lipids are good, all this good. Then I wonder if their inflammation might be reduced. So it was really a secondary find. So we decided to measure inflammatory markers. And it was then I realized, wow, the inflammation dropped even more significantly than we saw the cholesterol reduction. All good. It was then I, uh, uh, people who start taking it, like you say, with people with cystic fibrosis, people with lupus, they say that they were not able to hold their hand and they're able to hold their steering wheel and drive. That was when I said, okay, in the future, when I do more clinical study on this, I should definitely study the biomarker of inflammation. Great. I'm glad that you 
explained that a bit. I also know that there's been some research done on patients with cancer, I think uh, breast cancer in particular. And similarly, I would be curious what you think is happening in that particular case. Okay. In breast cancer, I, uh, m maybe in terms of mechanism, and then I can go back specifically to breast cancer, in the mechanisms in the cancer thing, toco trienol work at least in two, three ways that I know clearly. Mm -hmm. In cancer cells, you see, cancer cells are originally our own cells. And then they just, the DNA just kind of like messed up. And then when they get messed up, they typically would grow a hundred times or a thousand times faster than your cell. It's not good news, but they, this is how they work. So if they grow a hundred, a hundred to a thousand times faster, think of them as a wired, a kind of like a cell phone or something. They're completely rewired. So they have different signal because the normal cells simply don't grow that fast. So they have new and different signal. Toco Trino work to file up this signal so that it is not able to multiply hundred to a thousand times faster. This has been repeatedly shown for breast cancer and for other cancers that people study in this kind of one. So that's first mechanism. Okay, Another, so the disruption of that signal that would allow that cancer cell to grow disproportionately fast is right. disrupted. Okay. Yes, there's disruption. Right. So that's the first. And then another one would be if you think of a cell like, like a bean shape like that, it has cell wall. And most scientists would tell you that, that the cell wall is where the cholesterol is to help the cell to multiply. And if a cell is multiplying a hundred times faster, say, then you would see, actually, it would have 10,000 times more cell wall if, because it's two dimension. So if you have 100 times, it'll be 10,000 times. If it's 10,000 times more cell wall, it's going to have oodles and oodles of cholesterol to support the cell wall. And toco is known to inhibit cholesterol synthesis. It was a, originally studied how to lower cholesterol in people who take statin drug. So that one uh, uh, is not able to make the cell wall properly. So that will be a little bit more organistic. And then the, th the third mechanism is, if a cell had gotten past the size of a quarter inch, like two or three centimeter, a quarter inch, then we call that a tumor now, not a cancer cell. So when you have a tumor, it's an organism that is a little bit more organized. So it cannot just suck nutrient from the nearby cell, so to speak, by osmosis. Instead, it will grow blood vessel to the nearest artery and then kind of like a plumbing job to nearby artery and then have nutrient coming to them. That is how it is true. I know I'm making it simplistically. That is true. And if, if the audience wishes to, that process is called angiogenesis. Angio means artery, genesis means new, new artery. It's a new plumbing job to suck nutrient like that. And a, a drug called, amgen drug called Avastin does exactly that. And toco trieno does that too. Basically, it will go to the artery and it just cut the artery off and essentially starving the tumor to death. So those are the three mechanism, uh, the reducing reduction of the cholesterol, shutting down the signal that make the cell grow. And if it bypass those two and become a tumor, you cut off the feeding tube that feed the tumor to grow. We decided to do six different clinical trials in Denmark. And my colleague is separately doing his own in Florida. So I'm exceedingly pleased and holding my breath to see what the study results come out on those six clinical trials. And of those current uh, six clinical trials that you're doing, what are the areas of focus? Okay. I, currently, uh, 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 I, I will size it down like a funnel. In animal study, we have done two, three hundred uh, 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 cancer studies. But in clinical trials, we're limited because they're very expensive and they're time consuming. And we're not even a pharmaceutical company. So we have, we are now testing five 
of, of several hundred fives, so it's miserable five, better five than zero. The five clinical studies that we're doing on clinical trials are uh, pancreatic cancer, probably the, uh, the deadliest of all cancer, and then two uh, uh, women cancer, they are uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and then men and women colon and lung cancer. So mm -hmm. those are the five. Mm -hmm. Of those five, we have two that with results coming out uh, uh, that are very positive in my judgment. That would be my colleague who are doing pancreatic cancer. We can see that even in the lowest dose, we saw that the toco tri delta toco tri no kill the cancer. And the other one is ovarian cancer. We saw that in stage four ovarian cancer patient, uh, that taking a, a, a 900 milligram delta toco tri you know, we saw uh, that they have increased survival. And in, then the other three that we're anxiously waiting for the, the results are not yet uh, uh, forthcoming probably because of the uh, pandemic slowing it down uh, they are uh, breast lung and colon cancer yet to come very good and i also know you have a a book that uh, can be freely downloaded called the truth about vitamin e that if our listeners wanted to understand a little bit more. Do you want to speak to that to share that resource? Yeah, it, it, the, the book was like this. It was a labor of love about uh, 70, 80 pages long. So it's not very easy reading. I put in a lot of references. And if the audience want, want to download, you can type this Barry, B-A-R-R-I-E, Tan, T-A-N, my name, dot com forward slash book so it's very simple if you see me in person i'll uh, autograph a copy for you but you don't have to wait for me you can uh, find out that and and if you wanted to look for more information because this kind of information people keep publishing them as they go along and um, you can come to our website the company name is simply called american River Nutrition, or if you type my name, it probably leads you there. And then you can download all the studies that we have done uh, on, on the various conditions that we did uh, that include the cancer trials, uh, include the ones that you mentioned, and, and other ones that are largely chronic conditions. Currently, we are focusing on the last of the series of this kind of tocotrienol study, that is people with fatty liver disease is another subset of metabolic syndrome. We decided to go after this shape because 90 to 100 million adult Americans have fatty liver disease and it's very silent condition. And the last one, uh, probably you mentioned inflammation earlier on. And a significant number of Americans are carrying and people in the world are carrying a large amount of weight trying to see what tocotrienol can do to help people that have been carrying this weight. And this study is currently ongoing in Texas at the university where the professor is doing it. And when we do this study, we usually do it a, a double blind and placebo control. So for the audience, this simply means that double blind means that neither the audience, uh, neither the patient, nor the professors or the uh, uh, doctors know know that if they're taking a dummy pill or the real or, or the real uh, substance of interest. And then there's also a dummy pill group. So there's placebo control. So then when the result is unkey and finished, then we can see uh, if the, the one that took the real substance is any improvement from those who are taking a dummy pill. And also the bias is removed from both the patient and from the doctors. And it sounds like, you know, you've obviously been in this field of studying vitamin E for many, many years now and have kind of been guided by some fortune and you could say, um, you know, kind of uh, the in, in unusual opportunity to sort of stumble upon the Sonato plant and then discover that it had this particular form of vitamin E within it in isolation. 
Um, but when you look back and kind of review all of these years of your career, the research that you've done, what you've, the work that you've then accomplished utilizing this plant and the clinical trials that you've done specifically with tocotrienol, what do you find are the key takeaways? Like when you think about the legacy that you're leaving behind with your work and your research for our listeners that would be hearing what you think are are the most important pieces that you're leaving behind? What would those be in your mind? Wow. Well, that's a deep question. At the personal level, because I'm a scientist, and I'm not limited to being a scientist, but to the extent that I'm a scientist, I like to do, I, I want to do study that is the opposite end of what something would look like a snake oil. <laughs> if you think of a snake oil, the opposite end like that. In other words, it must be validated. It can show what it's supposed to show. So that at the personal level is like that. When it's not a personal level, but to the benefit of others, it brings me incredible joy and I would like it to be my legacy to find something or to discover something people would then apply and find this to be useful circumstantial and important to them and to that end this discovery of tocotrienol able to help to control chronic conditions that can be of use to other people is very special to me uh, because I see them getting better. I see them saying that something has improved in their life. That is very, that would be a great legacy if I can leave uh, that behind. So those, one at the personal level and one is for the utility and application of my listeners. Absolutely. And I know there was a study that was done a ways back um, I believe with children who had familial dysautonomia, um, which essentially the autonomic nervous system wasn't functioning uh, properly because of a genetic inherited trait. And you saw that there was some research around vitamin E that was conducted with those children um, that showed some benefit. And I'm also curious about the relationship between that autonomic functioning of the nervous system and vitamin E and what you think is the relationship between those two? The discovery of this autonomic function or automatic functions of the nerve was uh, uh, discovered by my colleague, Professor Birish Rubin. At the time, he was in Mass General Hospital in Boston, and now he's in Fordham University in Bronx, New York, like that. So it was, uh, uh, we, we quip about this, uh, this uh, a very smart Jewish gentleman uh, 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 discovered this in Mass General Hospital, and he's now able to continue his research in a Jesuit university, <laughs> in Fordham University, and he had been there for a very long time like that. And over the years, he, when he discovered this, I contacted him. I asked him if he would consider using anato tocotrienol. He, he, his discovery came prior to my discovery of tocotrienol that I can give it to him. So, but he did it on cell line study. He had already applied it to FD, uh, uh, affectionately called FD children, familial dysautonomia, uh, a dysfunction of the autonomic nerve that is genetic like that. So he said that he'll be very cautious and he'll try it in it. So I sent him samples. He probably did it for some three to five years and he was convinced that it would be safe and it would be useful. And then therefore he explained the utility uh, to those that follow him. I actually have no, I was just trying to do this as a, as a, something that is so rare, you know, and, 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 and is so destructive uh, to a young life. I was just trying to help. And then I was able to, and that bring me enormous joy. The off, that, that is Professor Rubin's discovery and he continued to use it and many stories if you ever go to the website to go uh, look at it myself uh, for me i'm only read only i do not interact for fear that i may influence anything on commerce which i don't want to do like that the offshoot that i have personally taken from that would be that 
if the toco trienol have some implication on this corrective system of the nerve, then I ask further the question, how might toco trienol be useful to other nerve conditions? It yeah. was that that I follow. Now that uh, I did not follow the autonomic nerve because Professor Rubin already did that. So, and this is when I did, I, I now I'm more and more convinced that it, it has something to do to help people uh, uh, in alleviating dementia which all of us are concerned about as we grow older. And then we do not want the word Alzheimer disease or, or loss of, of our memory system. So we now know this. When people take tocotrienol, or, or we, we did animal study, I should say. Uh, when, you know, the neuron here have a synapse, so they are communicating to the other side. And usually people talk about in depression, it's GABA, serotonin, and those good things. And then the tocotrienol is able to help the synaptic nerve in the communication. That's a very important piece. And that was just published by Georgia State University a month or two, a month ago. So I was very pleased about that. And then the other study was done at University of Texas. This is a more pragmatic, they use a psychology thing. It's called the Morris Swimming Maze. Just think of it like one yard, they, they put the water flowing here, and then the rats will be swimming. They, they swim against the current, and then they put a flexi glass, which is same color as water, so the animal cannot see it, like an inch below the water. And then the, the animal does not want to swim to exhaustion. They want to find the flexi glass. And then above the water, you put a green label on the swimming pool. Let's say it's white color, a green label, a, a, a sticky. And then in a normal rat, they will swim about once a, a day. And after five weeks or so, they're able to follow. Okay, if there's a green sticky up there, that's where the flexi glass is. So they'll come on, able to rest on it. When the animal is treated with tocotrienol, they're able to figure it out at half the time, like two or two and a half weeks. And that was statistically significant. And, and you know, in order that this is not a, 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 a anomaly, that is accidental. So they actually took the rat off for a month. So now if they do it again, the rat would have totally forgotten about this. So they have to train the rat again. And again, they're able to repeat that after two weeks or two and a half weeks, those given uh, just a, a, a dietary tocotrienol is able to find the flexi glass in two, two and a half weeks. And those who didn't takes five weeks long. So that tells me that even if the rats are older, they can be trained and they're able to keep and retain their memory and find that flexi glass. And do you think that the again, I'm interested in what you theorize is the mechanism that's happening there. Is there an increase in cognitive processing? Is it changing the response between the neurons? What do you think might actually be occurring that's allowing for the increase in memory and that retention? Uh, increase, you said the first one, increase in responses uh, uh, to the synapses was the Georgia State University. They, they, they found it and it's very significant. The one that is done in University of Texas, they didn't give a theory uh, uh, of how they may respond. They just show that the animal have increased response. So that's more a, 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 a physiological response or a phenomenon. They actually saw the response. And so that response is in search of a mechanism. They don't have one. I and see. the first one, the first one show a mechanism, uh, but the study was not in holistic animal. It was, uh, they study specifically uh, the neuron and increase of synapses. I think that this, this study is still uh, in the formative stage, Shay. So I think that in the next uh, two to three years more would come. I suspect that many Japanese scientists are very favorably disposed to this study 
study because the Japanese elderly population in the world is well known. And uh, uh, our average lifespan is 78. The Japanese lifespan is at least two to three years longer, like 80 or 82 years old. So, so they care much about this. So as their population got older, uh, that loss of their mind was not one that would be there that would highly compromise the quality of life. Mm -hmm. When you think about all of this in the context of healing, right, there's sort of health and healing, how we maintain health, preventative kinds of things that we could do, the application of this very specific form of vitamin E to decrease inflammation in the body, to perhaps prevent or decrease certain cancers developing in the body. You know, there's some really interesting possibilities here and the research is still playing itself out. So I want to be clear about that with our listeners too. But seeing some sort of exciting and interesting results that are starting to come in. How do you place all of this in the broader context of what it means to heal? How would you define or describe what healing is in the context of your research and work? I like to uh, uh, talk about healing in the sense of at the simplest level of a cell, not, not chemistry, not biochemistry of the cell. And then, and then the other one would be healing in the sense of longevity. So I, I, I know it's a very broad question and healing, you, you allow me great degree of freedom to explain this. In the cell manner, in each of our human body, cell look like a bean shape. We have about 38 trillion cells. It's a very big number. 38 trillion cells that hold our body weight is about 5,000 times the population of the earth. In each of these cells, and it is surrounded by a cell wall, and the cell wall of fat is about 80% fat. And of the three fruit groups that we, we take, that USDA tells that we should take, uh, fat, protein, and carbohydrate, of these three, fat is the easiest to go bad, oxidize like that. And, but then 80% of the cell wall are fat. So therefore, they are antioxidant that protects it, uh, that, that help the cell wall not to go bad. And 90% of those antioxidants that actually can stay in the cell wall are vitamin E molecule. This is long forgotten. I'm trying to come back to this. And they are the actual antioxidant for the fat. The reason I'm bringing this up because I suspect the audience is hearing the word antioxidant one too many. And, and it's just confusing. There's so many antioxidants, but I wanted to appeal to the audience this. The antioxidant that I care about most are the antioxidant that protects fat because fat is the easiest to go bad. Every moment we take a breath, we need oxygen. So we cannot live without oxygen, but oxygen can go bad in our body because about 30% of our body weight is fat or 25 to 30% and they need protection. And the kind of antioxidant that can protect them, they are vitamin E molecule like tocopherol and tocotrienol. So I'm thinking of the healing process is to keep the cell wall functioning good so the nutrients go in and the waste that generate, generated from the cell goes out and we have 38 trillion of them. That is at the simplest level of healing I can see possible without saying the word treatment at all. So that piece. The other one on healing is this. All of us know if we are not doing well, if we are sick or have any inf uh, thing that infirm us, well, a short way to say that would be life will be shorter like that so it, because we, we have to struggle to find where else a person who is healthy their heart is doing well they breathe properly they can walk they can balance themselves then things would be better like that but all of us are not necessarily on this squeaky clean system so i had asked that question many times on the healing. How do I do study like this? I, I don't know how to think of study like this. So, so we thought of a simplistic way to do it and other people have done so. I'm not the only one doing it. We, we study worms and other people study zebra fish. If you Google, you'll find this. 
They study worm and zebrafish because the entire genome, the genetic system of these two is known 100%, so they can characterize it. So they gave tocotrienol to worm, and worm has heart, just tiny worms like that. And normally, in their normal lifespan, if you do not stress them, do not do anything, just give them normal food, they live to 30 days, they procreate, and then they die. So, so therefore, a normal lifespan of worm would be about 30 days. And then when they give them tocotrienol, and even if they stress them and give them tocotrienol, they typically live 30% longer. So if you translate it to human being, how this would mean would be that if normally people live to 75 years or as an American, then 30 years longer would bring them to 105 and 110. That is not a bad news. And they consider that that is because it reduces stress on the animal. They also look at the DNA and the DNA is not messed up. The DNA or they, they study a DNA called a, a telomer so that the telomer is not shortened and stay the same length. This is actually studied. I'm just looking at. So the two healing keep the cell healthy and figure out a way to see if you can extend the lifespan of uh, an animal and translate that to human. If that could be, that's the best thing that I can. Now, for the audience, I know you asked that generally. My goodness, I'm not talking about a drug. I'm talking about a vitamin that can do this. So for me, this is a blessing of a discovery like that. So there you have it. <laughs> are, are there any known side effects to taking tocotrienol? Are you seeing any side effects? In all our clinical trials, I ask uh, the physician, can you document any side effects? They were not able to. And when people left the study, they left the study for various sundry reasons. None of them were because of toxic effects. They just didn't want to do it anymore. They did not feel a benefit or they have some other personal concern. They left the study, so they weren't. At another kind of thinking that people have shown, they said, well, vitamin E, they may have problem with clotting. Sometimes you hear people say that. So that, and so in that study, in the pancreatic cancer study, they, when they found out that they have pancreatic cancer, they have to go to surgery to remove the cancer in 30 days. Why is that? Because pancreatic cancer cannot wait. So the, the, the physician gave them tocotrienol. The physician only have 14 days, two weeks, and then they have to do it. 14 days is a very short time, but that's all they got. Is 14 days or no, or no study. So that's all he got. He gave them 14 days. They're under the scalpel of the surgeon to remove it. So the question being asked is, would the wound after you suture it heal? Because they have to do with clotting. And then they compare with those who were not given tocotrienol. So in short, those who were given tocotrienol at different doses, at 200 all the way to 3 grams, many fall higher to the one that were in control, not given any at all. The healing process of the suture were not significant in all the groups. Meaning to say, whether they take tocotrienol or not, they would heal similarly amount of time. So with that, I can say that it had no problem with the clotting factor, nor any other conditions that people might have. So I'm also pleased to know that. And as you know, Dr. Tan, my work through Integrative Touch as a social profit organization, we work with a lot of families who have a child who's seriously ill and struggling. And those caregivers, those parents, sometimes grandparents, aunts, uncles, can be very stressed from taking care of a, a family member with serious illness. And I wonder if you think that there is benefit to taking tocotrienol for the stress of, for example, caregiving. Wow. Thank you for asking this question, Shay. I, when we did when we had done all our studies, they were clearly for treatment. And then, then I answer your question very specifically after the context is known. 
We study people with dyslipidemia, high lipids. We study people with prediabetes, diabetes, fatty liver condition, lots of studies on that. Uh, we study uh, postmenopausal women with osteopenia, not yet osteoporotic. And then we also study men and women uh, who are obese with BMI greater than 30. Clearly, these are stress on the, on, the, on the person's life. But you are talking about a stress of caregiver. So hopefully not in this condition. If they were to be in this condition, absolutely going to be useful to them. So, so we did early on about 15 years ago, we studied people who are 60 to 65 years old. Otherwise, none of these conditions I just mentioned. We purposely wanted to do that. So just by aging process. So when we did that, we found this Shay. We found that the uh, lipids that tend to be a little bit high drop a little bit, not as significant, not as much as those that have dyslipidemia, but they did drop. We noticed we also study their liver enzymes. So oftentimes the liver tells a lot and the liver enzymes drop a bit. And then the oxidized fat in their blood also drop, which is a marker of stress. And then we also measure an inflammation marker called C-reactive protein. And the C-reactive protein drop. So for me, that was good enough. If a person does not have any chronic condition known, family history of X, Y, and Z, other than the living at the here and now, because they have to take care as your group of a family member or a young person, that brings a lot of stress. And I know this personally in my own family, when there was a young child, uh, fortunately things worked out well, but it was difficult. And both my wife and I are entering that for the first time. We have no books to follow. We just gave all of our life to do this. And during that time, I remembered my wife and I talking to each other. We have to take care of ourselves because if we don't, the person we try to take care of cannot get the maximum benefit. So I, I when you ask this question, I respond to it person. There was a personal context. And that study we did of the 60, 65 years old, they had no other known condition. And we saw that in taking this supplement, it just helped to reduce the oxidative stress just a tiny bit and the inflammation reduced a little bit more than a tiny bit. So yes, the answer is yes, it does help them. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I think Dr. Tan, you've done a wonderful job of giving our listeners some new insight into some of the specific benefits of vitamin E and particular form of vitamin E. Um, if there's anything else that you feel would be important to convey, I just want to give you an opportunity to do that <laughs> before we close. Yeah, thank you. When the audience go look on the internet on vitamin E, 90% of the time it will be tocopherol. I do not recommend you to take that. And of the less than 10% of the time, it will be tocotrienol. And you can find three kinds, from rice, from palm, and then from anato. So rice and palm will contain about 25 to 50% tocopherol that Shay mentioned that interferes with tocotrienol function. And then from anato, it is simply spelled A-N-N-A-T-T-O. If you look at any on the back of cheese, you'll find that the coloring of cheese is from anato. So if you want anato toco trieno, and if you want it to be very specific that it come from us, we make it here, right here in beautiful uh, Massachusetts. It, it's the only toco trieno make in this country in the United States. And then that we use this physical uh, technique, just uh, f make sure that the word Delta Gold, it's just our trade name, is from Anato. D Delta because of Delta Toco Trienol, Delta Gold, and that means it is it comes from us. We don't make finished product. We, we only do clinical studies. We only uh, document all the study we and other people have done, and so that people can follow what is newest coming. Otherwise, the, a list of other companies, if you go on the website, we list them all, and you can buy them from Amazon and from other people. So 
that that's the only comment that I want to make. Thank you so much, Shay, for allowing me to do this. And thank you to the audience. I hope this would be, there are many other things. This is not like a one hit wonder. It may be a one hit wonder for me. There are other good things in our life that we see as important. This will add on to the, uh, uh, to the dossier of different things that can make our life better to ourselves and to help those that in our care. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate your knowledge in this area, Dr. Tan, and I thank you for sharing it with our listeners. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.